Good afternoon, everyone from Don Ribbon Ranch in Lolo, Montana. We are about to begin a very exciting session from my perspective. I have with, with me today several people who are very involved with the Lewis and Clark expedition and explaining it to uh, to people and bringing the, that expedition alive. I'd like to first introduce you to Dwayne Bushy from uh, the Lewis and Clark Interpretive Center uh, in Great Falls, Montana. Uh, Dwayne is with the Forest Service and he is the education coordinator for the Interpretive Center. And with him is uh, one of his friends and a, a colleague and a volunteer, a, a guy named Bill Schuler. And I love the name Bill, by the way. My dad's name was Bill. So maybe you both could give us a big hello, Dwayne and Bill. Hello, everyone. Hello, and Butler says hello, too. Yeah. Well, one of the reasons uh, Butler is with uh, Bill, Bill owns Butler, and Bill is a Newfoundland dog. And today we're going to be talking about the one and only animal that made the entire trip uh, on the, the core of discovery, which was semen, the Newfoundland dog. But before I get to that, uh, I would like to also introduce uh, Jess Garby, who is uh, involved with the education program at Traveler's Rest. Can you say hello, Jess? Hi, everyone. So yeah, my name is Jess. I am Amer an AmeriCorps member here at Traveler's Rest. Um, just been here for a month and I'm coming from Florida. So I don't have, I I'll be learning more and more as I get along here and excited to get more incorporated with the Lolo community. Great. Well, I, I'm really delighted to have Travelers West rest with us here today, in part because when we first bought the property that we later named Dunrovin, we found a plaque on one of our fence posts that identified this property as Travelers Rest. And of course, by that time, we knew that it wasn't, but my husband and I were just jumping up and down uh, <laughs> with excitement that we even had this plaque. It was installed by the Lolo's Women, Women's Club some you know, 50 years ago or more when they had misidentified it. But if I'm not um, mistaken, and maybe you can answer this, Duane, uh, Traveler's Rest is one of the places where they have definitive proof that um, uh, Lewis and Clark camp there, and maybe one of you, either Jesse or uh, you, Duane, could tell us what that proof consisted of. I'm going to defer to Jess. It's her site, but I'm, you just tell me if you want me to add anything, Jess. Yeah, um, definitely was not prepared for this, but I could, I could, yeah. So we have um, in the early 2000s, they did an archaeological dig here, and one of the main things that they found was mercury within the soil from the mercury pills that the core consumed throughout the expedition. Um, there also was a button found from uniforms and a blue bead from um, the Native American tribes that were here before us. And this is the crossroads for the Salish community as well. So there is some Salish evidence here, um, but we do not touch any of that per their request. You can so, add anything to that, Dwayne, if you'd like. Yeah, the, the only thing that I would um, add is just, yes, like she said, they found physical evidence in the, in the button and the mercury and the bead, but then uh, with that mercury, they knew what they'd found. They'd found the site of the latrine, and being a military expedition, you know, they just didn't throw their sleeping bags out wherever they wanted. They uh, set up, in, in, according to General von Steuben's field manual, Army field manual, uh, and that's the manual that was used during the Revolutionary War to train troops on drill and messing and everything that you would need to know to be a successful soldier. So they were able to uh, take and recreate from the, once they knew where the latrine was, they were able to recreate everything else just as it would have been. This is fascinating. And if, and if I am correct, uh, Dwayne, they used that campsite twice, both going and coming, uh, going to the Pacific Ocean and then on their return trip. Is that not correct? That is correct, yes. Yeah. Well, thank you for a little bit of a brief history. Um, uh, uh, recently, during the pandemic, uh, Dwayne had a realtor friend 
uh, from Great Falls, a guy, a guy named Adam Monroe, who is with ERA Real Estate, offered to make uh, a, I don't know really what, really what to call it, but a, a, a drone um, um, interior of the Interpretive Center. And it's really cool, and it's something that all of you can do at home, although you have to get a minute to figure it out. So I'd like to start by having James take us on a short tour of the Interpretive Center, uh, where Duane and Bill are currently seated. And then after that, that'll give you a kind of an overview of the Interpretive Center. And then um, I'd like to get right into talking about Seaman the dog. So hit it, James. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm the invisible tech guy behind the scenes here, so don't mind me with the uh, faceless voice. But I will go ahead and share my screen right now, and uh, let's see if I can put that on the display for you guys to see here. There's a few things we've got to make happen as we do this, so stand by. All right, I will go ahead and share my screen up top here. So this is, uh, I, I will share this link in chat. And what happens when you come in here is it shows kind of a bird's eye view of the interpretive center and allows you to come through and take a virtual tour. So it's, it's not a drone video. It's a 360 degree camera that is positioned at different locations in the facility. And here we are walking in the front door Anytime you see a little dot here uh, with the green dot, you can pull that open. And there you see a video and some additional information that pops up. So each one of these locations has kind of a, a guided uh, interpretive aspect to it. And you can see little rings on the floors that pop up. And you're able to go to each of those rings. And you can click your mouse and spin around. 360 degrees. You even get views of the ceiling if you want it. Uh, here we go in front of some of these pictures, and we can zoom in on some of these different things as we move throughout the facility. And he, we'll go ahead and walk through the doors, almost like magic here. Uh, and we spin around, and we can take a look at different aspects. We can even look at the floor a little bit closer and the compass rose there. And I see a little dot over here. I'm going to walk a little bit closer. And we can pan around and check things out uh, right here and, and see some of the exhibit spaces. But I do see another one of these green dots here. I'm going to get, click on that. And that automatically pops up a, a little video with additional footage and some uh, additional information uh, that you can get from this vantage point. I'll go back over here since this is just such an amazing display here. And we can look right up on it. We can read the text. And I don't know that we can read the text super clearly on some of the smaller areas. But I just clicked down through the, the glass there, and I ended up on the, the bottom floor here. So here's more exhibit space as we move through. Uh, anyway, you could, you could spend a lot of time in this area and check things out, clicking all the little dots and moving through the, the facility here and checking out all of this great information. So I will share this link in chat and you can take your own self-guided 360 degree tour through the facility here. And uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop sharing my screen here and hand it back to Suzanne and Dwayne, and we'll go from there. Wow, that was terrific, James. I really appreciate that. Uh, I've been there a number of times. It's in an incredibly beautiful location along the Missouri River, right near the Great Falls, which, of course, was a prominent feature uh, with Lewis and Clark. Um, and with, uh, you know, the, the whole expedition, if you have not read uh, the whole expedition in one of the popular books, you're really missing out. You need to do that. It's just a fabulous um, expedition in which so much was discovered. And the Great Falls, of course, presented them with a serious obstacle because they were coming up the Missouri River. 
But today's focus, I'd really like to put on the animals that were uh, important uh, to the expedition, specifically uh, the dog Seaman, as he was the only animal that in, uh, traveled with the entire uh, the trip. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dwayne for a few introductory remarks, and then I believe he sent us a, a, a video, a presentation that goes into some depth about semen. So, Dwayne, get us started to talk about semen the dog. Okay, yes. So, uh, sure, excited to spend a little time with all of you. And so, what this video is going to kind of go over is, you know, Suzanne was asking earlier, why would you want a 150-pound animal to have to take care of as you're trying to survive and make your way across the country? So, my hope is I do address that a little bit, that this uh, video that's going to come up is going to talk a bit, little bit about uh, how that relationship between Captain Lewis and Seaman uh, would develop, and then uh, some of the exploits that Seaman is uh, so well known for along on the expedition. And then it's uh, kind of the ending is we're not exactly sure, but it's fun to speculate on what exactly happened with Seaman uh, in his last days. Well, thank you, Dwayne. Okay, James, you're on again. <laughs> Good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dwayne Bushai from the Lewis and Clark Contributive Center here in Great Falls, Montana. And it is my privilege, my pleasure, uh, to be able to spend the next few moments here with you uh, and participating in this series that uh, the Dunroland Ranch has been featuring on Montana Socials called Animals as Helpers and Healers. Now, when uh, Suzanne from uh, Dunroven got in touch with me about potentially being a part of this, I uh, instantly began to think of the favorite friend, the pet that was brought on the expedition of Lewis and Clark and the Corps of Discovery, a uh, Newfoundland dog that belonged to Captain Lewis. And uh, I just began to think of the different stories and how fun it is to just share that story and to share it with all of you here today that are able to tune in and watch this. And so uh, that's what we're going to do here over the next few minutes. I want to introduce you to Seaman. The, the, the dog of the core discovery. Now, he was a Newfoundland dog. And I have this uh, picture here that maybe uh, will call your attention to. It's done by Don Graytech, is one of the ones that we have here in the museum. He's a well-known artist out here, uh, does a lot of pencil drawings. And, uh, but you see in this drawing, we've got Captains Lewis and Clark, and then next to them, Seaman, the Newfoundland dog, Captain Lewis's favorite friend. So what we're gonna look at here uh, in the next few minutes is why a dog brought on the expedition, right? You know, why did this ever happen? What, what did he do? What were some of the things that we know about him? And then what happens to Seaman in the end? And uh, so to begin with, uh, you know, what is it that brings this relationship to be between Lewis and Clark and the core discovery and the Newfoundland dog, Seaman? Well, it all begins with Captain Lewis. And uh, he's been recently appointed as the commander for the upcoming expedition. Uh, it's a presidential proclamation uh, coming from President Jefferson himself, who has appointed him. And he's beginning to study and provision and get ready for this grand expedition. And certainly his desire for success is great. He's putting his full faith and effort into this. And I'm convinced that a point comes where he realizes that, okay, I'm thinking about the welfare of the men on the expedition. They're going to be carrying the burden of this expedition. And uh, it brings him to this thought of bringing along a dog. So why is that? Well, we do know that one of the uh, uh, charges, if you will, from Jefferson was to explore the waterway that he thought went all the way to the Pacific Ocean, the Northwest Passage. And so assuming, yeah, okay, we're going to be on the water a lot. Now, in that era, in, the, in this country, in fact, if we were in the early 1800s and I had 100 of you with me here today, and I was to ask the question, by a raised hand, how many of you know how to swim? There might be two, three, but the vast majority did not know to, how to swim. It was not part of the upbringing in the early days of this country that uh, swimming is a skill set that you seek to hone in on. So when it comes to anybody that works around the water a lot, so think of you know fishing boats, fishermen, uh, certainly not uncommon for them to have a dog and of the Newfoundland breed. Uh, so why, why a Newfoundland? Well, they're a big dog for one. Um, they do like the water. 
they've got partially webbed feet that really aids in the strength of their swimming and their ability to swim. And they've got a waterproof coat. So, I mean, it's just like they're ready made to be on the water. And then you add to that just the, their desire, their loyalty to mankind. And they certainly they are unafraid, undaunted at any challenge that involves them getting in the water to get somebody that they think needs help. And so they were commonly carried on water vessels to be able to save people that go overboard. And I'm confident that this is what, what went through Lewis's mind too. Hey, I'm going to have a number of people here. No doubt the occasion is going to come where we might find ourselves in trouble. And so he purchases in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, a Newfoundland dog. His name was Seaman, and he pays $20 for him in 1803. $20. Well, yeah. you might be thinking, that's a bargain. Well, let's just back up a little bit and kind of put ourselves in the minds of a, somebody in the early 1800s and what kind of wages were being paid. And we'll look at Captain Lewis specifically. His wages as a captain in the United States Army were $40 a month. So this captain traded a half a month's wages for this dog out of his own pocket. This was not funded for him by the government. But out of his own pocket, he pays $20, half a month wages. So yeah, this was uh, no impulse buy. He put a lot of thought into this, and this was an investment, and it was also the beginning of the relationship between Captain Lewis and Seaman, the Newfoundland dog. And so uh, he continues to provision, get ready for the expedition. Finally, the keel boat is done, and he's heading down the Ohio River uh, to meet up with uh, Clark and some of the rest of the ones that had been chosen and to uh, pick the rest of the ones for the expedition when they winter over down near St. Louis in 1803-1804, but on the 11th of September of 1803, we're going to see the first notation in the journals of Lewis and Clark about seamen. And apparently what has happened that is being related to us is there's a bunch of squirrels that are swimming across the Ohio River as Lewis is coming down in the keelboat. And, you know, dogs being what dogs are, squirrel! And a seaman was a no exception. Out he goes, and he adeptly chases down and catches one of those squirrels in his mouth. Uh, to return to his master. And so that is the first mention in the journals of Lewis and Clark about seamen on the expedition. And then throughout the two years, four months, and ten days of the expedition, just every now and again, here and there, we'll see something come up that just lets us know that, yep, seamen's still there. He's still doing the things that he does. He's still developing that relationship. No doubt there was a, a strong bond, not only between Lewis and seamen, but between all of the members of the expedition and seamen. And so we see where he gets bit by a beaver once, it severs an artery, he, he nearly bleeds to death, but Lewis with his doctoring skills is able to get him patched up and uh, back in good shape again. And then there's a, also a time right after they leave Fort Mandan in 1805, uh, it would be on the 12th of April of 1805, and apparently Seaman, you know, he got preoccupied one night and he disappeared and didn't come home all night long. And Lewis would document in his journals that his dog has not returned and he is very worried. There's another occasion that uh, we see on the return trip when they're coming back. Uh, they're in the Columbia River Basin and uh, they're making their way back, uh, heading east now, and they come in contact with some Indians, the Watlala Indians, and they steal semen. And as soon as Lewis finds this out, oh my goodness, he is not happy. In fact, he assembles some men, make haste, go after him, spare no expense, bring the dog back at all costs. Um, they are able to get the dog back, but I, I bring that up because this wasn't just a relationship of, okay, this is a beast of burden that we brought along to save people if they go overboard. No, he developed a relationship and attachment to all of the, the members of the expedition, and no, no doubt uh, he was endeared to each and every one of them. There's a favorite story I always love to tell, and it uh, kind of gives you a little insight maybe to contributions likewise that he had to the men of the Corps of Discovery, <clears throat> and that would be on the 29th of May of 1805. So the Corps of Discovery has come as far, they're in the, what we would be considered the boundaries of Montana today. And, you know, they're going against the current of the Missouri River. They've got two flat bottom boats, Perros. They've got those six big dugout canoes, all of them filled to the hill with equipment supplies. And then they've got seamen, they've got Sacagawea, and they've got a little pomp or a little baby. And then they've got all the rest of the men of the expedition. And this is tough going. And they're averaging about 14 or 15 miles a day, literally dragging all this stuff against the current upstream. They've got ropes attached to the front of the boats. Well, on the 29th of May of 1805, they go 27 miles 
my work, doubling the production that they normally would have. They go way into the night before they finally pull up and they camp and they bed down for the night. And uh, no doubt when they bed down, it, it, it was lights out as soon as their heads uh, would, would hit the ground. And uh, before I go farther, so remember, just as a reminder, this is a military expedition. So they don't just bail out and sleep wherever they want. No, they, there's discipline that has been instilled, long instilled through lots of drill and practice. Every time they camp, they set up the camp basically in a similar way. The, the men all sleep in squads. They all line up, you know, in their respective areas around like, and the, the cooking is done in one area and the latrine is in the other area. And so they're all sleeping in their formation that they would be in. And unbeknownst to them, across the river from where they're encamped, a bull bison enters into the water. It swims across the Missouri River. And when it explodes up out of the deep, it's right there where the pros are beached on the shore of the Missouri River. And it comes up and stampedes up the embankment and it's crashing through the camp. Seamen. You know, being a little, more, a little more alert as dogs are, a little bit better sense of smell and hearing and the like for such a thing, he be, immediately begins to bell or bark. And it's the bison stampedes down one of the squads of men, and literally his, his hooves are coming down 15, 18 inches away from where the, heads, the, the men's heads are laying. And then he's challenged by semen here, and that bison apparently spins, turns, and runs down another squad of men, again, right next to their head, except this time four or five inches from their heads. But remarkably, off into the dark he goes, and almost as quick as it started, it's over. And the men are, I can just imagine them looking around, scratching their heads. What on earth has just happened? They examine the, the hoof prints from the bison, and then they realize where they were sleeping and how close it was. Oh my goodness, this was almost disastrous. They just about lost two-thirds of the men assigned to carry out this expedition just in one fell swoop from this bull bison. But again, this kind of gives a little proof here to just how good it is to have the dog around. What would have happened if he wouldn't have been there? It's fun to contemplate. But it also kind of leads into there's another uh, uh, predicament that they frequently found themselves as they come in, in, into this area of Montana, and especially why they are encamped to make that portage around the five falls of the Missouri that were in this area. You know, they went 18 and a quarter miles around all those falls. They were here for an entire month. Lots of time for a camp to get kind of sneak, stinky, kind of fragrant, and certainly an attraction to the grizzly bears. And they had daily occurrences, daily and nightly. There was no rest for the weary when it came to these grizzly bears. And seamen would frequently serve as a sentry of sorts to keep an eye on things so the men could get some sleep and they have the trust that should any bear activity be detected, he's going to bark, he's going to wake him up so they can defend their camp and their very lives has happened in some cases. So yeah, definitely a, a valuable contribution to the core of discovery there. So as we get towards the end of this presentation, you know, you know what happens to him? The last journal entry in the journals of Lewis and Clark that occurs July 15th of 1806. So they're actually still in Montana, but this time they're heading east. They're on their way back to Fort Mandan and then down to St. Louis. And uh, they've ran into those uh, pesky mosquitoes again. And Lewis is going to record in his journal how Seaman is howling from the torture of these mosquitoes as he tries to get some relief from them. And there's just none to be had. They continue to be troublesome just as they were when they came up uh, the Missouri River. So that is the last journal entry that we have of Seaman is in regards to Lewis and Clark and the Corps of Discovery. So what happened to him? I mean, did he run off? Did he die? Did he make it to the end? And was he celebrated along with everyone else? Uh, was he there with Captain Lewis over the next few years and on that fateful trip when he was going back to Washington, D.C. to defend um, some vouchers he turned in to get reimbursed for personal expenses that he incurred on the expedition? And he was fatefully killed, whether by his own hand or by a murderer along the Natchez Trail? We don't know. There's really nothing to lead us. I, one thing I am confident, though, I'll, I've had people ask me, you know, they don't, did he really make it? Yeah, I think he did make it. We've heard a little bit about, you know, Seaman and how, uh, how they thought of him and what an important member of the expedition he was. There's no doubt in my mind, if something tragic would have happened to Seaman, it certainly would have been documented for us in the journals. But there is no documentation to be had uh, beyond the 15th of, 15th of July of 1806 concerning Seaman on the race of Harvard and Corps Discovery. So 
What does happen to him? Well, we get a little bit of an insight to a possibility anyway. A possibility that would lend credence to he was there all the way until Captain Lewis was killed in, uh, in 1809 when he was on the Natchez Trail headed back to Washington, D.C. And that comes through a man by the name of Timothy Alden. Now, he was a congressional clergyman of the time, a well-respected historian of the time. And in 1812, he publishes this five-volume set of uh, epitaphs and inscriptions. And if you were to go through the, that volume, five-volume set today, for entry number 916, you're going to come across something very interesting. So somebody has turned in an artifact something to be displayed in the museum. Who turned it in? Not exactly sure. Um, could it have been Captain Clark? It's very likely. And you'll see why here in just a moment. But what, what is this that has been turned in? Well, he's making reference to a collar, a dog, dog collar, that has been turned in to be a, a museum piece. And there's an inscription on this collar, and he does record the inscription. I, I've got it here for you. It reads, the greatest traveler of my species, my name is Seaman, the dog of Captain Meriwether Lewis, whom I accompanied to the Pacific Ocean through the interior of North America. Hmm, that's interesting. I, I mean, that certainly lends credence to, all right, Seaman made it for the, through the whole journey. Um, this uh, artifact was displayed in the Alexandria Washington Lodge, Mason Lodge, number 22, later known as the George Washington Lodge. Uh, but uh, it, it was interned there and that was, it was shown and displayed in that museum. And then there's this letter that was written on the 21st of August of 1812 and it's sent to Captain Clark. Now, the letter does not delineate what it was that the curator is thanking Captain Clark for. But it says, I, I want to take this occasion to thank you for the truly valuable present that you made to our museum. Hmm. Could that have been the call? We don't know for sure. But it is fun to think about. And it's fun to even know that it is kind of a mystery and we just don't know for sure. Uh, but it's a fun story all the same. And that's kind of the intrigue of it sometimes when we don't have all the answers and we can leave some of that to our own imagination. So ladies and gentlemen, that's a little bit about Seaman of the Core of Discovery, how he came to be on the Core of Discovery, some of what he did along the way, and then what we think may have happened to him in the very end. I've certainly had a good time here with all of you this afternoon, and I, I wish you all well. Thank you. Dwayne, that was just fabulous. I have to say I learned a lot, and I actually have a lot more questions. Uh, one of the things that that you really show is all of the holes in history, that the documents say a little and then they don't say a lot for a long time and then Siemens collar shows up and we don't even know who it came from or, or what the end story was. Could you address that just a little bit about putting together all of, of the Lewis and Clark story, the, the kind of nuts and bolts of having done that? I mean, it's a, it's a huge endeavor, isn't it? It is definitely a huge endeavor. And I mean, again, it's not like there's all this prolific documentation out there that you can go to. You just kind of hunt and peck. And I mean, some of it is in, in the journals, but those uh, what I was sharing with you about the exchange between the, the curator there in the museum and the letter written to Clark. I mean, you, you want to think that that is definitely addressing Seaman's collar, but we don't know. And it, it just tends to kind of stir this insatiable appetite to, well, there must be more. And then you're always thinking, well, what, what is going to be discovered one day on, on something somewhere, maybe in somebody's attic that might shed a little further light onto this one day. And I, that, that's probably one of my favorite things about relating stories of Lewis and Clark and the core discovery. It is just, it's timeless. And it's just so rich and intrigue in so many ways. We're talking about Satan today, but um, we could almost pick any character and uh, we end up with the same kind of results once we, once we start digging into it. Well, uh, uh, I certainly learned something about Newfoundland dogs, Bill, and I'd like you to elaborate just a little bit. Uh, first of all, the name. Did it come from the fact that these were seagoing dogs? I mean, 
Could you elaborate a little bit on the the history of the breed? Well, the breed actually started up in Canada. A lot of the seafaring captains wanted somebody on the boat that could help save somebody if they fell overboard. And Newfoundlands were bred for basically water rescue. They have the uh, they have so much air in their fur they can basically float without even paddling, and they do have webbed feet, so they are great swimmers. And it was an asset to have a dog on the boat when you were fishing that could save you if something happened. And if uh, you've been on a boat before and it gets gets a little bit rough, that's a possibility of falling overboard. Yeah, absolutely. And I did not know this about Newfoundland dogs, the webbed feet and their great swimming abilities, because generally a dog of that size with that amount of fur is heavy in the water and kind of sinks down. It would not be very useful, but clearly they've been bred specifically for that reason. Yes. A lot of people who own Newfoundland dogs have a very hard time at the lake if their kids want to swim. Because the kids are splashing out there, and the dog wants to save them. <laughs> and they'll well, grab them by their arm and put them back to shore. They have very soft mouths. So they're not going to hurt anybody. So um, maybe you can bring Butler front and center here. We can only see his head. Is there a way you can get him in front of the camera a little bit here? So we can well, get a better look at it. Screen a little bit. Yeah, there you go. Thank you, Dwayne. I appreciate yeah. that very much. You bet. So he's about the size that Seaman was and the same color, basically, as well. Are they all black? Well, they think that Seaman was actually a Lancer, which is the black and white Newfie. And you see, a, Butler's got a little bit of white on him. Uh -huh. uh, so this is more than likely about the same size of dog and about the same... A uh, dog with the same exuberance that uh, was on the expedition. This mm -hmm. dog would not have a, a trouble uh, no, doing an 8,000 mile walk there and back to the Pacific Coast. Well, um, uh, you also use this dog uh, in hospice work, so it must mean that he has a good temperament. Is this also typical of the breed? Do, are they generally people friendly dogs? Newfoundlands are known for their loyalty, and they are perfect with families with kids. Uh, they're very gentle. Um, the other dog I had here as a volunteer was Buddy. Uh, he was a 200-pound Newfie, where Butler's only 120 pounds. But he would be here, uh, lay on the floor, and one of the school groups would come, and once in a while you'd have a, a sick child, and the sick child would cuddle up to Butler or to Buddy and take a nap. <laughs> and uh, the kids would crawl over the dog, not a problem at all, just very tolerant. Yeah, I bet he's a terrific ambassador uh, for the Lewis and Clark presentation. So how, Bill, did you get engaged with Dwayne? How did the two of you come together and how? what kind of, um, you know, um, relationship do you have in terms of these presentations? Do you have specific presentations that you per participate in? Well, what happened is uh, I retired uh, in 2016 and moved back to Montana. And my neighbor, two houses down, is actually on the board of directors here at the Interpreter Center. And he said, gee, we could use your dog at the Interpreter Center. And that's how I got involved. And uh, I put in over, what, 1,500 hours of volunteer work with the dogs here, both this one and the last one. Wow, that's wonderful. It must be a joy for you, and I'm sure you've learned an awful lot by hanging out at the center. You've become an expert yourself in some ways. Oh, yes. And again, because they're such good ambassadors, that is why I've also trained the dog uh, with hospice. Uh, my first dog was trained up in Alaska, up in Fairbanks, to work with hospice. And uh, I'm in the process now of working with the new dog, and we're also going to hospice and doing some hospice work. Hopefully when COVID gets over, we'll be able to do actually visits to the residents. Right now, he just joins me when we take the menu, uh, the items for dinner to the rooms, he joins us and delivers. <laughs> well, what a great asset he is. 
Dwayne, I've got some questions for you now about uh, semen and the expedition, if you wouldn't mind. Okay, uh, I'll get I, back in the picture. Yeah, I really appreciate this, by the way. This has just been terrific. I assume that both that most of the Indian tribes had dogs of their own. And so what was the relationship between semen and the dogs that they encountered along the way? So there's not an awful lot that I've seen about there being any kind of a really comment about what, what the relationship was between semen and the other dogs. Um, you're definitely right. They, there was a, a number of dogs that they would come in contact with on the expedition. Um, the Indians were impressed with him. Uh, we, we, uh, you saw my presentation where when they stole him, Lewis, you know, spare no expense. Uh, I later on, basically he said, you can use uh, deadly force to retrieve him. So they had permission to shoot whomever had the dog if they wouldn't return him. And then there was another, um, earlier on in the expedition, some Shoshones uh, came up to them when they were heading up in 1804 and offered three beaver pelts. They wanted the dog. Um, and then, you know, the, I guess the other piece that comes to mind, uh, roughly 127 dogs were purchased by the Corps of Discovery along the way from the Indians, um, but they were looking for something to, to feed themselves with. Yeah. So that's sure. primarily why the Indians had the dogs that they came <laughs> in contact with. Yeah. Yeah, but it seemed like uh, semen performed many of the things um, – the important functions that the dog served very primitive man. I mean, that's how dogs became domesticated is, you know, they served that sentinel kind of role uh, yeah. in, in awakening people like the, I mean, that was a, a pretty horrific story you were telling about the bison along the, the, the river there. That, that's a, a very close call. And I can see where semen would have been really just instrumental in all of that. Oh, for sure. And you know, the other thing, when they uh, were out at Fort Clatsop on the Pacific coast and, you know, almost five months they spent out there and they make mention of out of that entire time frame, there was only 12 days that it didn't rain. And of those 12 days, only six days that they saw the sunshine. So I don't know. We just think about how good a dog makes you feel when you show up and they're always glad to see you. And they always want to just, uh, you know, uh, give you that, that welcome that you're, that they're, they're happy for you. They're happy to be yours. And they give you that undivided attention. There's no doubt that Seaman was a big boost of morale anytime he was around any of them. And I assume that the core fed him, that he was not re required to catch his own meal. No, he, was. No, he, he was fed along with the rest of them. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Okay. So you know, another thing that I think is kind of interesting, just not in Lewis and Clark history, but the history of the breed. Um, there's some very famous people in our history. We think of Napoleon Bonaparte. So the first time he was put into exile out on uh, the LB Island there, you know, and he made his escape in the, in the little uh, John boat and he got caught in a storm and he got pitched overboard. It was a Newfoundland dog that kept his head above the waves until he could be rescued uh, by a fishing boat. That's uh, amazing. But I thought Bill said that the breed actually originated in Canada. Is that correct? And yet they were already back in France. I mean, it, it sounds like th that breed must have, must have come through most of seafaring nations that were exchanged in some way. Yes. That's, is that that's right? Exactly right. There is, uh, it's un undocumented, but there is some uh, anecdotal stories out there about it was a Newfoundland dog that swam in the frigid waters when the Titanic went down for three plus hours and it was the barking of the dog that alerted another ship that was in the area to uh, help rescue some of the, the folks that were some of the few that did escape in lifeboats but you know they debriefed a lot of people on that and it's that you would think that would be widely corroborated and it's not but anyway it's a fun story. Yeah, it's very interesting. So I wanted to follow up on a couple of things. You said that he disappeared on the trip out. And could you elaborate a little bit? Did the journal say that he showed up a couple of days later? Did somebody go find him? What happened on that particular incident? He did show up the next morning and Lewis would say much to my relief. Yeah. Uh, but he was very worried about the dog because he was gone all night. And he yeah. had done that before apparently. And uh, yeah, you could... 
when you read his his writing there of uh, that particular incident, you can almost feel the worry of my 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 favorite friend, and we're we're so new into the expedition, and he's already gone. Because that's shortly after they first got underway, and I you know I've got to imagine that uh, Seaman too was kind of getting used to the the rigors of the expedition, all this that was going on each and every day, and what he was out and up to. I guess doing what dogs do sometimes, just go you know, doing a little reconnaissance of the area, yeah. maybe found something that was interesting to him. I'm sure from a dog's perspective, the the core of discovery was a wonderful life to live. I mean, you know, oh, that's yeah. what they're kind of born to do. So what about when the Indians stole him? Well, what was, how did that play out? How did the that story play out? Well, so leading up to that, um, there had been, uh, there was at one point where they were going to, uh, trade with it they're, they're going to they need horses again um they have the horses that they left with the nez purse when they were coming westbound and so they're going to trade with some indians and they run into some indians on the road um and they immediately come and it, clark can tell their intent is to take the dog and he drew his knife that was the only weapon that he had at the time and uh, with the intent to stab them should they try and take the dog and they took off into the forest and then it was like the next day is when uh, they ran into Indians again who took a hold of the dog and took off with him before they could do anything about it. Um, and that the only thing that, uh, you know, what I shared there in that program, once uh, that occurred, Lewis was just uh, mad beyond belief. And he was he basically chased him down and shoot him. He, he sent three men after him. And what happened when, when they went after him, uh, they actually never got close to one another they spied them and it was estimated they were about two miles away and the Indians realizing that they were being chased, they left the dog right there. And so when they got there, semen was there, no Indians were around and it was, you know, no, no further incident. And they came back much to uh, Captain Lewis's relief. He was really glad to have his, have his dog back. So the other thing that piqued my interest was the fact that um, semen had a collar. I mean that the collar was given to the museum, but I would not have thought that in this day and age, or in that day and age, that dogs wore collars. Can you elaborate at all about that? Well, you know, that's, uh, Suzanne, that's something that I might just have to go back and look a little bit at myself, because I don't know whether I've really got a good answer that I can, I can give you. Um, I guess the one thing that uh, I, I would offer is, you know, when it comes to um, saving, you know, as a water rescue dog, just thinking maybe it was something that they could firmly uh, grab onto uh, without impeding the dog's progress to try and keep, you know, uh, somebody's head up above the water. I, yeah, I don't know. I'd have to, I will have to look at that one. I don't have a good answer for you. That's just a little conjecture on my part. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. In fact, I was going to ask if they had any particular kind of harness or something for Newfoundland dogs, because it would seem that some kind of something to hang on to that didn't pull the, the dog down or didn't impede its travel in the water would be very helpful. Yeah, yeah. I'm, just, I'm just curious because I wouldn't have thought that dog collars were common uh, during that period of time. Yeah, I'm sure that they weren't common. Um, but again, when you think of the fact that uh, you know, like we discussed there, Lewis gave a half a month wages for him. I, he probably wouldn't have spared the expense of a nice collar to put on him either. Yeah, <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, I just so appreciate this. Um, and it's really a good segue into talking about horses because this last little uh, bit you mentioned that they were looking to purchase horses. And, and you've prepared a great little PowerPoint um, for uh, discussing the horses relative to uh, the Lewis and Clark uh, expeditions. Oh, let, let me, we have a question from one of our viewers before we move on. Okay. Uh, uh, and here it is. It says, he also read an awful lot of words that were inscribed on the collar. Were they burned in? That's a good, that's a good question. You read what was in the inside of the collar. And so was, it, was, they burned? it was engraved on brass. And the brass was affixed to the collar. Wow. And that then, was a pretty important dog. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sure. 
And then, so, and what happened to that collar? So there was a fire in 1871 that destroyed nearly every artifact of that entire museum to include that collar. So all we have is we've got the, the entry in that, uh, in that book that the clergyman wrote. And then we have, you know, that re referring to the collar. And then we have the letter that was written to Captain Clark uh, thanking him for his donation, but we don't know what it was. So that's, unfortunately, no caller is left. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. But, you know, this is the fun of history, isn't it? There's these little gaps. And it's yeah. always going to be something of a mystery, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, Bill, I just want to thank you so, so much for uh, bringing Butler to our attention. And if you would love to um, take a photo the next time you take him into a hospice facility or something like that, I don't want to intrude on anything privately, of course, but send us uh, some follow-ups. We'd like to keep track of you and your wonderful dog as you, as you go along. We really appreciate that. And with that, I'm going to share my screen because um, Dwayne has this wonderful um, little PowerPoint about um, horses, and I'm going to... Um, click through it. Dwayne will tell me when to go next. And um, hang on here. I think, James, you have to allow me to share my screen. Not able to do that right now. So you have to enable me to do that. Okay, here we go. All right. Okay, I'm going to bring up, you should now be looking at the first slide, which says, Horses of the Court of Discovery. Do you see that, Dwayne? Yep, I see it now. And uh, yeah, so this is a painting done by George Catlin. So he was an artist that would uh, follow in the footsteps of uh, Lewis and Clark and the Corps of Discovery uh, about 26 years after uh, they did their expedition. But uh, I kind of use this as the intro to my talk about horses because it's it's very interesting as Captain Lewis, Meriwether Lewis, as he enters the stage of history as we know it and exits that same stage eight years later, the two uh, prominent bookends on uh, both sides of that stage are horses. So the first time is in uh, 1801, March of 1801, and he takes, he's got uh, three horses and uh, he has been invited to uh, come to Washington, D.C. and accept the presidential appointment to be President Jefferson's personal secretary. And uh, as he is making his way, one of the horses uh, uh, becomes lame. Uh, anyway, the short of that story is he's three weeks late showing up to accept uh, this uh, appointment to uh, serve as President Jefferson's secretary. So that's that's the introduction of Lewis, uh, Meriwether Lewis into uh, the pages of history. And uh, then it would be eight years later. Uh, once again, he is on horseback. He has uh, a gentleman by the name of Major Neely who is uh, uh, escorting with him, helping bring some of uh, the supplies. He's on his way back to Washington, D.C. He has all of these um, manuscripts of his journals. He has... Uh, these unpaid vouchers that uh, have been refused to, to be paid. And so he's in financial difficulty and uh, he's making his way back to DC to uh, defend his name, to try and get some money back to uh, certainly it's weighing heavy on his mind that the journals are yet not published. And oh, by the way, two members of the core discovery have already published their journals. I'm not sure quite that he was really that happy about that either, but uh, Anyway, it's here that he ends up uh, on October 9th of 1809. Two of his horses disappear during the night. And uh, so he goes on alone uh, the next day and Major Neely is left to uh, retrieve the horses and then join up with him later. And he makes it as far as Grinder's Stand there on the Natchez Trail about uh, 70 miles uh, uh, south of um, Nashville, and uh, sometime in the early morning hours, two gunshots are heard by the proprietor of Grinder Stand, and they uh, they find Lewis dead. So uh, that's kind of the my little intro of horses in the expedition. And you can go to the next slide now, and we'll talk about uh, horses along the expedition. So uh, this is a Charlie Russell painting, 
and it's illuminating for us when they finally, the core discovery finally comes in contact uh, with the Shoshone, or the, um, and it turns out to be uh, Chief Kamawea, who is Sakagawea's brother. And so they were getting worried. They had left Fort Mandan in April of uh, 1805. They hadn't seen any Indian, although now it's August. And there was no question left in their mind after they spent that winter in Fort Mandan of 1804 and 1805. All of the Indians that they talked to said, yeah, there is this major obstacle that you're going to have to go over. There is no waterway to take you all the way to the Pacific Ocean. You absolutely are going to have to have horses. So they've been in search of Indians and horses the entire way. And we're growing quite concerned that they weren't coming across any. And then finally here in uh, August of, uh, of 1805, they do come across the Shoshone. And that's what this picture is uh, showing them. They would end up, uh, in this case, uh, when they get down to the, the horse trading, they end up with either 29 or 30 horses. When you read the journal entries, it's a little hard to decipher exactly how many they went away with, but it was either 29 or 30 that they end up getting from uh, Chief Kamalea and the Shoshone. And certainly no doubt the fact that uh, Sakagawea was uh, the chief's sister, uh, played favorably for the core discovery uh, in their horse deals. And, uh, you know, I sometimes get asked from people, so what kind of prices were the, they paying the Shoshone uh, to get a hold of these horses? And so, you know, they traded all kinds of different things uh, that they brought along with them. They traded uh, knives. They, they traded uh, the coats, their dress military coats. Uh, they, they, they were uh, favored by the Indians. And, uh, but it ended up roughly being about uh, merchandise worth about $6. Uh, was what, what most of those horses that they got from the Shoshone cost. So they get uh, they end up, like I said, getting 29 or 30 horses from the Shoshone. So that's good, but they need more, but they have to move on now. And that takes us to our next slide. Can I ask a question, Dwayne? Yes. Okay. So what kind of tack did they have with them? I assume that the horses were traded as pack animals. They wanted them not to ride, but to but to pack their gear, is that correct? So yeah, primarily they're looking for beasts of burden to bear all of the things that, they're, that they had in their uh, canoes, their dugout canoes and the like uh, to be able to get them over the Rocky Mountains. So, but yeah, they did ride them too. But yeah, they were looking for beasts of burden to carry all their gear. because they, so they, they would have made all of their tack, their halters, et cetera, from ropes they would just sit down and make it on the spot. Is that right? Yep, that's right. And they, you know, they, uh, they had elk hide ropes that they had an awful lot of, and they learned they got very good at making those as well along the trail. Um, you know, they were, they were really pretty good at fabricating things such as that. Um, they were making moccasins every single day after about the month three of the expedition because all 12 sets of shoes that they were issued were worn out. And uh, from that day forward, for the rest of the trip to uh, the West, they're making moccasins every day. So yeah, this was that was not a big deal for them to uh, come up with the tack that they would need for the animals. And then they traded for, the, the Indians had pack saddles uh, and, and the like that they traded for as well, as well. Is there any description of their pack saddles? Did they use anything like a saddle tree did they use wood on either side of the horse's spine i'm just curious whether whether they had or, or you know you talked earlier about the field manual that they followed you know from the revolutionary war period was there any mention in that of how to uh, fashion tack for a pack animal not in von steuben's field manual but so um, yes, there is mention of the tack that they had. And actually, there's mention that many of the horses were in uh, their their backs were sore and the uh, skin had been rubbed, the fur had been rubbed because the saddles fit them poorly. Uh, they were taking uh, goat's hair. They were taking hair from animals to try and uh, put additional pad padding underneath of the saddle so that the horses were more comfortable. Um, you know, this is probably a good point for me to just pause for a moment and talk about, you know, there's a lot of wonderful adjectives that we can use to describe the men of the core discovery, but adept at horsemanship is not one of them. 
uh, <laughs> this was uh, this was something very new. And you know, by the time this expedition was over, I mean, you know, just in rough figures, out of the, they were they were gone twenty eight months, and uh, they go eight thousand miles. And uh, of that total trip, about 500 miles of the westward journey and about 1,000 miles of the eastward journey were they could have been considered a cavalry unit. That, and that, that spanned about six months of that 28 months. So during that time, they really could have been referred to as a cavalry. They had all those horses ranging anywhere from as many as two to up to 65. They needed more on the return trip than they did on the trip going out, out to uh, – out to the west. So, but I tell you, um, I'm aware of. I counted this out once. Uh, there's 30 different days um, of of that time when they are heading to uh, the Pacific that they are thrashing around in the wilderness trying to recover horses that got away from them during the night. Uh, so, and then you know, there's countless occurrences of horses going over, sliding down hills. Um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to bring to mind Lewis making a comment just after uh, uh, one of the horses when they this was when they were going west, going over the the Bitterroots and it slid a hundred feet down the hill and he says something to the effect that it was the greatest escape he had ever seen, meaning the horse getting out of the slide and escaping all the boulder fields that it went through and everything and managed to still get back up when it was all over. <laughs> yeah, well, they're, they're a good mountain horse is a good thing. I'll tell you that for sure. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Wait, I could um, actually mention too. Um, Lewis had lost one of his horses down up here in Lolo, and so they had got to Lolo Pass, and he made some other people come back and search for his horse, which I thought was hilarious. And then something else that I had learned here at Travelers is that the horses. Um, they were never like never tethered to anything. So they just had like this long collar and the men, if the horses were walking off, they could just like step on the leash. And so they were never like tied to anything. They're always like close in hand. Um, but I thought that was interesting that they never were tied to a tree. They just stayed as long as the grass was good enough to eat. Yeah. Thank you, Jess. That's great, Jess. This next uh, famous painting again by Charlie Russell is uh, picturing what's known as Ross's Hole. So this is where they come in contact with the flathead of the Salish people. And uh, uh, once again, they would prove to be uh, friendly and uh, e eager to trade. They get 10 more horses here to add to that 29 or 30 that they got from the Shoshone to uh, help them on their trek. Uh, getting ready to go over the, those shining mountains or the rocky mountains that we know today. Uh, so that will take us to our next slide. And this one just simply is entitled Lewis and Clark on the Lolo, on the Lolo Trail. Now, this is a seltzer painting. And it's, it's interesting. You know, I work here at the Interpretive Center in Great Falls, and we talk about that portage and that great feat of human endurance that's, that that certainly was. But um, I, I, I'm going to share a statement with you that was made by Lewis, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But it was in reflecting on what it was like on this Lolo Trail with the horses. And he would write, he'd say that it was the most wretched portion of our journey, the Rocky Mountains, where hunger and cold in their most rigorous forms assail the weary traveler. Not any of us have forgotten our sufferings in the mountains, and I think it probable we never shall. It was, you know, basically they were 340 miles. They didn't know where the end was. You know, they kept coming to the top of one range and there's just more to be found beyond. And, you know, they're struggling with the horses all the time. And then a new challenge that they'd not dealt with before is, uh, you know, now all of a sudden, you know, they, they're used to getting square meals on a regular basis. It's not working for them anymore. There's no game. They're getting deep deep in snow, the game has all gone to lower country. Um, before it's all over, they've eaten three of their colts and uh, they're reduced to, uh, I wonder if anybody's ever heard of portable soup. So if you can imagine today's bullion cubes, and I have a little morsel, I don't know if anybody can see that, but a little morsel 
of portable soup, and uh, they are, are reduced to trying to reconstitute this in water and uh, to take it on to get some kind of substance to give them energy to keep going. And, you know, they have the one stretch there, 11 straight days with virtually nothing to eat, colder than they've ever been in their lives, and just wondering when it's all going to end. And unlike the portage, where that was very hard work, but at least they're getting fed every day, and they do know where the end is. But I think mentally speaking that, yeah, this trek over the Rockies was just, it, it was a challenge on every respect beyond the imagination. You know, I suppose that uh, the forest type was much similar then as it is today, which is mostly lodgepole pine in, in the low, low drainage, which is very um, uh, difficult to take horses through. They grow close together. They come down easily. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of downfall. And uh, I've tried to ride my horse through a large pole forest, and it's, it's, it's incredibly difficult. Um, and I have a, a Forest Service permit for a portion of the Lolo um, Trail, the Lewis and Clark Trail up Lolo Highway 12, up Lolo Creek. And, you know, people think they went up the creek, which, of course, they didn't. They couldn't. I mean, it would have been almost impa impassable. Uh, but it's really rough country. Even now with something of a trail there, it's rough country. So I can appreciate just how arduous this had to have been. Just incredible. Yeah. I like those words he used, the most wretched portion of our journey. I think that <laughs> says it all. Yeah. yeah. And if you remember, too, I believe that they went, they left here in September, did they not? And they encountered really deep snow uh, in the past in September. You know, our, our winters have gotten a little later, but it was early September that they left and we were up on Lolo Pass. Is that not correct? That is correct. And yes, they ran into a lot of snow. Yeah. And again, you know, I, their clothing, their, their footwear especially, that, yeah, they were just chilled to absolute bone. It was a, a test mentally and physically for sure. Yeah. So this next picture, actually, we're fast forwarding. Actually, if you could go back one, Suzanne. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. There. This is showing uh, uh, riders in the snow. Now, this is actually on the return journey. So they did. They made it over uh, the Rocky Mountains. They meet the Nez Perce Indians. Uh, they're so glad to see them. Uh, they they get really sick on all the salmon and. Uh, and bulbs that they eat because they, well, one, they've been starving to death and it had been a red meat diet and now everything completely changes. But, uh, you know, they do. They end up making it out to the Pacific. They leave all of their horses with the Nez Perce Indians to retreat and they're going to retrieve them when they come back the following spring. So they make new dugout canoes. They uh, uh, change modes of transportation. The horses are left with the Nez Perce. They go out to the Pacific. Uh, we talked a little bit already about uh, just how miserable that was after them, and they likened it, many of them likened it in the journals uh, to being uh, just like a prison, just a miserable place, a miserable existence. And they are eager to go home. I mean, you know, they've accomplished their goal. They got to the Pacific Ocean, and uh, no doubt uh, thoughts of home are coming a little more uh, often. Uh, they're homesick and kind of like a horse, maybe they're starting to feel a little barn sour and, and eager to get going on that trail again. And uh, so when they head back, uh, going up, they're trading for horses. Uh, that proved to be quite difficult. In fact, they got to the point where um, some of what they didn't have anything hardly left to trade. And Clark ends up uh, doing some practicing some medicine that they would uh, pay for through with horses in return. But uh, they're so eager to get back over against the advice of the Nez Perce, they take off and they get stuck in drifts that were as deep as 15 feet, they record, and they had to turn back. And so that was the only time on the journey, and that's kind of what this painting was uh, supposed to reflect, was that part of the story, is uh, the only time on the expedition where they had to turn around and retrace steps, steps and retreat, because they just couldn't make it through the snow. But, and you can go to the next slide, Suzanne, they do finally make it. They make it back to Traveler's Rest. And then um, from Traveler's Rest, they uh, rest and recuperate. And uh, it would be 
uh, Clark, and it's gonna, he's going to take off with a group of men and 49 horses. He's going to head south, and they're going to go explore the Yellowstone. Um, they're all going to be dividing up here. Lewis is going to take that uh, the old Indian trail. We call it today the road to the buffalo. And uh, he, then the Sergeant Ordway is going to lead a group of men to do the portage from Great Falls in reverse, and they're going to have horses to help them this time. Uh, but this particular picture here is a uh, picture in Clark heading down onto the Yellowstone. So this is in July. Um, in fact, uh, it would be early July. And on the, on the 6th of July is when they, they take off. And no sooner had they taken off than it, they, they see a, a fire that had been burning, still burning. The coals were still hot on the side of the road, uh, of the trail that they were on. And uh, they surmised that it was Indians. And that very night, Nine horses, they wake up in the morning, nine of their best horses are gone. And so that was a little disturbing. Uh, off they go again. And uh, it's not very long after that. And Lewis, on the 18th and 19th of July, respectively, both days, not Lewis Clark, excuse me, uh, he notices, he sees smoke signals. So he sees Indians communicating. He doesn't see the Indians themselves. But on the 21st, when they wake up, half the horses they had left are gone. So now they have 20 left. And at this point, and you can go to the next picture, Suzanne, the next uh, painting. Okay, I'm going to interrupt again. I'm, yep. I'm a little obsessive about tap. <laughs> and if you notice in this painting that you see a britchin and you see a, a breast collar and you see a saddle, uh, that, that um, one of the Corps of Discovery is riding in a saddle. Is this, how uh, accurate are these uh, pictures? I mean, they're beautiful, these beautiful uh, works of art, but I'm curious about the accuracy of some of these. Is that something that you would know anything about? Well, I know that uh, we have a couple of uh, replica Indian pack saddles that they had, um, you know, and certainly they would have fashioned the breast collars because it wouldn't doesn't take very long to realize that you've got problems when you when you try and go uphill with right. heavy loads if there's not something there to secure that uh, on the breast. Um, you for sure are much more adept at picking out particulars on tack than I would be. But yeah, well, I'm just, they, they, I, I, they did have saddles that they, had, that they had traded and got with the Indians as well to be able to use them as pack animals. Yeah, that's interesting that they had already traded that. I mean, those leather saddles probably came from trappers or somebody else who, you know, I'm just, I'm interested in this. I'm going to do a little investigating myself because I find this very interesting. What and the, in, the Indians did have saddles. Um, we know that, and we know they got, in fact, um, uh, Patrick Gass uh, complains about how uncomfortable their saddles were. Ah, okay. I, that's, not, that's coming to mind now as I think of that. I'm remembering reading uh, his word. He complained about, you know, it was just horribly uncomfortable. Yeah, I bet. Okay, thank you for my interruption. Appreciate yeah, it. No problem. All right, so uh, Clark and company started out with 49. They've got 20 left now, and uh, he's exasperated. This is not going well. It's not even been three weeks, and you know they've lost over half of the horses. And so he uh, he uh, instructs Sergeant Fryer uh, and uh, a few of his men out of his squad, and they, he wants them to take the remaining twenty horses and uh, head overland and take them back to the Mandans. He wants to give them as a gift uh, to the Mandan Indians as uh, as trade, and uh, he implores Sergeant Fryer to make sure that he's keeping a uh, Diligent watch for the horses, especially at night. Two nights after they take off, they wake up and all the horses are gone. All <laughs> 20 of them. And uh, uh, it's Sergeant Pryor, he does uh, do some investigation and he does record that he found that the tracks of the Indians not 100 foot from where they were sleeping, where they had come in uh, during the night. So I don't know whether they, they were just uh, really covert or whether Sergeant Pryor and company didn't take the captain seriously. But regardless, the outcome was the same. They lost all of the horses that they had. And uh, it kind of reminds me, there was a, a, a 
Omaha Indian saying that said that you can a, a horse you can possess but never own. And yeah. they certainly uh, were able to live that. They had them for a while, uh, but it, it, they, they, they weren't able to hold on to it. And that is the last photograph. And that kind of sums up their time with the horses. Just a couple of things to add on. When they first left Camp Dubois in uh, St. Louis there in May of 1804, they did have two horses with them then. And the horse was kind of helping them to get through sandbars and the like with the big keel boat they had. Um, but they weren't too far into that journey. And uh, one of the members of the expedition got lost. He was, and he had a horse with him. That was George Shannon, the youngest member of the expedition. He was 18. Um, he's lost for 12 days. And uh, when they finally did find him, um, he was half starved to death and the horse was gone. He'd lost the horse too. And then uh, actually not too long after that, they lost their other horse thinking it was probably stolen by the Teton Sioux. Yeah. Well, um, trading and stealing of horses was a very common activity among the tribes, was it not? Yeah. Uh, some, of, some of the books that I have read, including a, a book called Fool's Crow, um, which is by James Walsh about about that same time when, when you know white men were just coming into the country that um, raids on each other were very common to steal horses. So, I mean, a horse was an incredibly valuable uh, thing for the Northern Plains Indians, very valuable. Absolutely very valuable. In fact, um, you know, depending on the tribe, the only thing that may have rivaled it as far as a trade item would have been a gun once guns came onto, onto the scene. But, uh, yeah, they were very valuable. And it was considered, you know... Um, uh, great medicine, if you will, to be able to steal horses. You were looked on as a conquering hero uh, yeah. if you brought horses back with you. So, I mean, if nothing else, Clark and company made, you know, a lot of proud men back in their in their uh, own tribes there, for sure. I, I One other thing I wanted to share that I've, I've often wondered to myself, so Jefferson didn't think too much of horses either. Um, at least that's kind of what I gather. He, he makes some comments about you know, uh, Indians being able to travel nearly as far as uh, a man on a horse could and being much the better for it after it was over. But I, I wonder if uh, he, w when he had read the expedition journals and realized what a difference those horses made, if it kind of made him rethink that. In fact, uh, Congress had asked him when he was preparing for the expedition uh, about the need for horses. And there's he testified before Congress and he made the comment, he says that the need for horses would be merely incidental and transitory. So in, in his mind, that was not something that they were concerned about. And maybe that's why horsemanship was not a skill set that they uh, used to recruit any of the people that they had on the expedition. Yeah, yeah. Well, they misjudged, didn't they? But they misjudged the Rockies in a lot of ways. They were astounded when they first set uh, eyes on them. They didn't didn't anticipate that. As no, much. they did. They were figuring it was going to be just like the mountains they knew back in the populations right. that we know today. Right. I have a couple questions. Okay. Um, first of all, in some of the paintings, there were depictions of canines. Were those depictions? Do you think of dogs or of wolves? Were and were there any were there any um, um, mentions in the diaries of any interactions either between the horses or semen with uh, uh, predators other than grizzlies like wolves or it were, were, were they a, a problem to the to the uh, not, not that is mentioned first I wanted to address the two of those paintings are Russell paintings that uh, yeah. I shared with you and Russell was famous for including a wolf in many of his paintings ah so that may have just been a big a gratuitous inclusion for sure. But I will say this, too. Um, there is plenty of accounts of them coming across wolves. And in fact, Sergeant Pryor, um, on, when they were heading with the horses to the man dance before they would meet back up again, he got bit in the hand by a wolf while wow. he was sleeping. Wow. Um, and when they came through this area of Great Falls, they were seeing wolves on a, on a daily basis. Uh, they were feeding upon the carrion, the, the bison that had washed over the falls, which was common occurrence. And then 
would die and that their uh, flesh would wash up on the shore. There was plenty to be had as far as feed was concerned. Um, as far as any uh, problems with predators and uh, seamen, the only, you know, it's, they talk about him catching squirrels. He takes down uh, a pronghorn. He catches up with it in the water. That's, in, uh, that's amazing. Drewlyard wounds a deer one time and seamen uh, is able to take the wounded deer down uh, for the hunters. Um, trying to remember anything else. Yeah, I think that's about it. I, but I never see anything in the journals uh, regarding, you know, like a, a wolf trying to get him or a bear getting a hold of him. Um, he did prove to be pretty good at sounding the alarm that uh, would cause the, the, the bears to uh, consider what they were about to do and in some cases uh, give the, the men chance to stand up and, and protect themselves in their camp. So uh, one other question we had, Dwayne, was uh, were there, was there any mention in terms of feeding the horses? You know, during the 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 one photo or, or painting that you showed of the snow, that would have been incredibly difficult for horses to find feed themselves, and certainly the the much of the forested areas doesn't offer a great deal of grass. So, was there was there any mention about uh, issues related to feeding the horses? Yeah, there was. Um, so, and that was one of the frustrations that they had to give uh, priority to wherever they camped there had to be feed for the horses yeah. uh, or the horses would leave them and they'd have even more troubles than they were already having. Right. Um, it's interesting too, another thing that just came to mind. So they, uh, the, the, the mandans, they found out from the mandans that the horses like to eat the cottonwood bark. That, and the Indians fed them cottonwood bark during the winter. Isn't that and, interesting? and they, there's a couple of mentions about, you know, the idea that that, you know, they wish they had some cottonwood bark when they were in the, in the bitterroots there going over the Rockies and uh, there was no food to be had. And uh, they, they talked to about uh, the horses um, getting a little ornery as they're not getting fed and they're still being asked to do the work that they were doing. In fact, I did not bring this up, but on the return trip, so, it's in the springtime, and uh, the, the horses uh, have a lot more energy. It's spring, you know, they're the, the, the studs for sure. That uh, The male horses, they're pretty exciting. It's like, okay, mating season. Many of the horses were not gelded. Um, it finally got to the point, in fact, where they decided they were going to uh, attempt to geld some of the horses to take a little of the spirit out of them. Um, it did not go well. They, in fact... I'm not. I'm paraphrasing, but Lou, uh, Clark makes the comment that they're not. They're not nearly as good at it as the Nez Perce, who had showed them how. And in fact, on uh, they ended up uh, shooting Lewis's horse because it uh, swelled up and got infected really bad. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's not an easy thing to do for sure. This and has they have been more problems holding on to the horses coming back than they did going out. Yeah. Well, this has just been fascinating, Dwayne and Bill and Jess. I can't thank you enough for uh, indulging us. Everybody, oh, we got all kinds of good comments about how much they've learned, how much people have enjoyed this and, and learned. And I'm hopeful that you will invite us back, Dwayne, because there is so much richness to the Lewis and Clark expedition that really impacts Montana. I mean, the very thing behind you, the dugout, for example, um, that that's a whole another story, though, the traveling on the water and the Great Falls and all of that. So yes. I, I really appreciate this opportunity and I'd love to have you come back for a, a different aspect. That sounds good. Yeah, we'll just have to make a plan and make it happen. It's been a lot of fun. I've, I've just had a ball too working with you and, and uh, now I've got a partner out there in Traveler's Rest who she spent a season with us as well. So it's just uh, really super neat to have her out there. And one of these days, I'd love to come and see your place. Absolutely. And uh, and I love the idea that you're thinking about a, a, an Osprey web camera on the Missouri. We would love to collaborate with you on that. And I also want to say that um, um, 
um, thank you for wearing the lovely uniform, Lewis's <laughs> Captain Lewis. That was great. I really appreciate that. That was terrific. You, you make you looked authentic with your with your gray goatee and everything. It was great. <laughs> Thank you. That was wonderful. Yeah, we really made it come alive for us, and I can't thank you enough. So okay. without further ado, I'm going to sign off. We're a little late, but boy, I'll tell you, it was sort of worth it for me. I learned an awful lot and appreciate it greatly. Thank you, James, for the help. And again, thank you, Bill, for bringing Butler. We hope to see some photos of you in the future. Please do send us. We'd like to keep track of you. And Dwayne, we'll, I'll get back with you for another episode of Lewis and Clark. Jess. Come on over to John Robin and let's see what we can do to collaborate. Okay. Thank you all. And with that, we'll say goodbye. Bye.